Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. I hope we are online already. We are, good afternoon. I hope we are well seen and heard. Uh, my name is Małgorzata Bonikowska. I represent the Think Tank Institute from Poland and the Center for International Relations. It's my pleasure to meet in uh, this uh, uh, group today with Marta, Marta Fonsowicz from Sky. Hello. HR director and Tomasz Zalewski. Tomasz, hello. Hello. From Bird and Bird. And uh, the title of the panel is quite interesting even for me. I am not at all an expert in AI, but um, our think tank follows the uh, um, developments concerning the AI solutions implementation, uh, basically in Poland, but also in um, other countries of the European Union. So we were um, very intrigued by um, this kind of chance to discuss what would be, you know, the future of AI and AI solutions, basically, and also how to handle the issues, the challenges uh, which the AI brings to us, because it can have many good things and we all want as many uh, solutions based on AI and big data implemented. But in the same time, we have also some questions, question marks, challenges, ethical questions. And that's what we are trying to discuss together in this panel. If I encourage everyone to put questions if you also have them. So maybe let's start with Marta. Uh, Marta, I just wonder from your perspective, uh, a person who is deeply into the HR, and we generally say that uh, artificial intelligence can be really a problem for HR. Um, and for also those who look for uh, jobs. What is, from your perspective, the, the practical aspect of using AI in uh, your job? And if yes, could you give us some examples how you really use AI solutions? Absolutely. It's, a, it's an extremely interesting topic. And I, I would say that I look at it more from recruitment perspective because my career has been mostly within, within recruitment and recruitment services within large corporate uh, 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 companies and uh, uh, recruitment is probably that part of HR that has advanced technologically the most, the fastest. That's really, if you look at HR, recruitment is at the forefront in using technology. Um, and it's starting from candidate attraction through to candidate selection, through to hiring and onboarding individuals. Um, and I've seen probably more um automation rather than ai specifically when i and think what do you about, mean by automation if you can explain to us of course yes automation in the sense of utilizing software or or systems or or um uh, specific tests for selection that would help more with the administrative part of of recruitment uh and it and it helps both candidates and it helps uh the companies uh rather than ai although i have probably a couple of examples of of trials uh of of ai and and basically companies attempting to use ai um in in some shape or form um so it's mostly automation if i understand you correctly ai uh, somehow helps hr uh, directors uh, to select for uh, positions right so that's a very huge uh, area to discuss about being biased by these algorithms but that we'll do in a moment tomek uh, if i may ask you because you are a lawyer mm -hmm. bert and bert is a is a very well-known um, legal mm -hmm. firm uh, in your profession uh, what would be the uh, first of all do the legal firms use ai at all if yes in what way well they, they use they use, but uh, only, I think, um, in a very specialized areas. So usually uh, to process, to analyze uh, um, um, very big uh, databases. So, for example, during the due diligence processes uh, uh, in the tra various transactions, um, one of the tasks uh, for the lawyers is to analyze uh, all contracts that were signed by the target company, the company that is going to be purchased. And uh, so in some cases, you have uh, thousands of contracts and you must uh, review them. So um, in the past, it was done completely manually. Now we have the tools based on machine learning 
they can uh, quickly identify uh, clauses for which we are uh, for which we are we look at the documents for example clauses uh, forbidding the transfer of ownership or uh, creating the right of the of the purchaser uh, to terminate the contract and and so on and if i may ask uh, a little bit in details uh, these are the tools you you subcontract. You work with uh, IT companies, or you 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 have it on a license base. How is it? Um, usually, uh, law firms uh, just uh, um, purchase the uh, license uh, from the vendors who uh, developed the, the tools based on AI. Because that's I, I guess that's what our audience is all about. It's most. Uh, the people who listen to our talk, I believe, are mostly from the IT sector as well. Uh, so maybe it's uh, it's good to know that legal uh, firms, that will be also the market which will expand more and more because the data mining here and data science, how we call it, is necessary uh, to these kind of um, uh, challenges the legal firms have. Uh, the same question to Marta. Marta, if you use this automation, what would be the business model? How do you cooperate with do you cooperate with the IT companies or you use license software? Mostly, yes. In fact, very recently, um, RTM, the company that I'm um, employed by and, and we collaborate closely with, with Sky as one of our customers, we've been exploring a, a specific AI tool, a um, tool that uses human language, uh, spoken mm -hmm. language through spoken interaction with candidates. Um, in the very, very early stages of the candidate engagement process, just in the beginning of the process where you would have initial conversation with the candidate, it was done through AI. It's similar to, you know, potential phone calls that you may receive about, I don't know, uh, insurance or, or banks offering you some products. And you know that you're speaking to a robot, to an AI, you're not speaking to a human being. So taking that experience, but applying it in that, initial interaction with with candidates so it was it was done through an external provider and i believe there's actually more and more companies like that on the market that begin to offer chatbot solutions and even uh, human language kind of ai that could be leveraged in recruitment industry or even human resources that's interesting because of course we are all used somehow at least in poland it starts to be quite popular that the bots are uh, really answering uh, the, uh, the the call centers and the first contact you have with huge company is very often uh, the robot uh, the bot who speaks to us of course it's still not perfect and there are also many challenges to really be able to communicate well at this stage depends what kind of problem you you, you call for but I immediately want to ask you about the challenges concerning this uh, this algorithms this being biased because we can say, okay, uh, when in your kind of profession, um, these algorithms can select badly, can maybe, it can be a wrong choice made. How would you comment on that? How would you avoid these kind of, this kind of dangers? I think one of the uh, biggest arguments for using AI in, 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 in recruitment, in selection is to avoid bias because human beings we, we do have bias, all of us, whether it's conscious or subconscious, we just have that. And of course, it is assumed that a software isn't biased because it's not a human being. It doesn't have emotions. It doesn't have biases. The interesting thing is that, of course, it is human beings who develop the software. And we have some examples from the market, one that, that was pretty um, uh, uh, well known, I believe, uh, recently was from Amazon that you know, created AI to, 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 for pre-selection of candidates to avoid bias. However, what, what they were trying to achieve is hire more female um, uh, uh, candidates into their company. However, historically, their um, employee workforce was mostly male dominated. And because AI, through machine learning, developed um, a selection uh, based on those previous um, uh, hires, and most of those previous hires were male, it started automatically rejecting CVs that were indicating that a candidate is female because you know there were certain words mentioned on the CV or certain expressions or even names that were unfamiliar to the AI or perhaps not hired before in the company. So what quickly transpired is that AI learned on the basis of the 
creators on the basis of the previous data that had already been biased. So that's the danger. I don't think we can actually avoid bias, at least not at the stage that we are at the moment in terms mm -hmm. of how developed AI is. Maybe the name we are using, artificial intelligence, is really misleading because we are st still at the stage that there's no intelligence yet. Maybe it's sure. just still mm -hmm. more tools, algorithms, uh, you know, uh, IT tools, how to name it, um, where we don't really expect too much of intelligence, at least at this stage we are now. In the future, let's see. Uh, Tomek, the same question to you. Um, don't you, um, are, aren't you afraid that in, in your work, you know, lawyers are a very important part of our society. They are important in their judgments and uh, consultancy they offer. Uh, don't you uh, think that it could be also biased in your case that these artificial intelligence tools uh, don't select or don't uh, find the right things mm -hmm. you really want to find? Okay. Well, I'm, I'm not afraid. Um, I'm not afraid because I know that, in fact, all technology solutions that we have, uh, they are biased somehow. Um, well, I, I think that we started to talk and discuss the problem of bias when we started to develop and use artificial intelligence systems. But in fact, bias was amped in any technology, technological solutions that exist in the past. Um, well, it's, well uh, usually when we talk about technology, uh, we tend to say the technology is neutral. So mm -hmm. like, like in this slogan, uh, which was made famous by National Rifle Association in the USA, uh, guns do not kill people, people kill people. Um, well, it's, well, it's not true, in fact, because guns were designed to kill people. Um, well, there, there, you, you can find uh, some examples of uh, technology that is neutral, like, for example, well, knife. Knife might be uh, used for many things because it's quite universal. But knife can kill as well. Yes, yes. Uh, but if, when we think, when we talk about an uh, informational systems and um, and IT systems, especially artificial intelligence, uh, each system is uh, based on some values that were amped in it, that were taken in consideration while developing a system. The problem is that uh, sometimes the designer of a system intentionally developed, uh, um, well, put some values um, in, in the design. For example, we have a principle privacy by design. What does it mean? It means that when you design a system, you try to um, use such features of the system that would promote privacy over um, other values. So for example, if you have a system um, that would uh, um, record certain data, for example, the history of your orders, it would, uh, um, well, by default, uh, delete the, this data unless you decide that you want to keep them. If, uh, if you do not apply this principle, usually the history will be recorded forever. And uh, probably you will be never even asked whether you want to keep it or not. So with uh, artificial intelligence system, I think we have the same problem. But the problem is uh, that quite often uh, the values and the biases are amped unintentionally. So with, for example, that we have a data set that is used to train uh, the artificial intelligence and we believe that this data set is complete with is without any errors so it reflects uh our our world reflects our environment but in fact uh it's not true and it may give uh, completely false uh, results and there are many many examples uh, how um, artificial systems that were believed to be quite fair uh, mm -hmm. have produced biased results but don't you think that, um, and I encourage everyone, by the way, to put questions or comments on the chat if you, if you want to, uh, but I'm just myself um, thinking, you know, that you said technology is neutral. Maybe uh, this was really the case for a long time, but if we think about how and which way the artificial intelligence solutions can be developed, then inside this notion we have this, uh, this assumption that it will be intelligent you know, sooner or later. And when we think about real intelligence, we, of course, uh, presume that this, this system, these algorithms will be able to learn, will be able to, um, to uh, 
combine the data, not only co collect the data, but also learn from the data collected and take some conclusions. Mm -hmm. And for example, change the behavior uh, or for example, give some opinions or sentences even. We have this uh, you know, forecast very soon or even now it starts to be uh, the truth in the judiciary system that at the initial level in, in the courts, um, uh, you know, it can be uh, artificial intelligence can be used and can suggest the sentence. So if you think about this development, it can be uh, a problem with biased artificial intelligence. It's not really completely neutral because it starts to think, to reflect. Well, how to put it this way? I don't even have the, the language to describe it because it's not real thinking, but it's learning, it's taking conclusions. Don't you think that this will change the approach to all the technology? Because it's not only about how the technology is used. It's also about, it's like the gun, you mentioned the gun. It's like the gun who itself starts to shoot without mm -hmm. participation of a person. Okay. Right? And the gun who selects whom to shoot mm -hmm. first. So in this case, the, the challenge of being biased is very, very important. I don't need to mention this famous example given always about the Google car, right? Whom to really kill first if you are on the road and you cannot avoid killing. You have to, you know, select between a, a child or the old person, right? These are ethical dilemmas, how to really uh, be able to avoid it. So my question after this very long introduction is, can you see the future in your industries, in your professions, for example, Marta, in your profession? How do you see the the next step? Because now it may help you, and it's already mm -hmm. biased. But what will be the next step? I I would um, I'll answer now. Throw a little bit more uh, into into the conversation that's going to bring perhaps even more challenges to 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 our panel today. Um, uh, so firstly. Um, I would never say no to technology. I mean, it has made uh, uh, professionals life so much easier and you know all of us who have ever applied for jobs or were in conversations about any new career opportunities we've touched technology in some shape or form even through filling an application uh, or, or we may not even be aware of it but for example the job description may have been uh, put through an AI kind of tool that helps uh, to change the language that's used on the job description so that it attracts a certain type of a candidate, be it perhaps a female candidate or be it perhaps a person who's maybe more sales oriented or more technology oriented. Th these things have been going around for years. But what I'd say is it's helped more with the administrative part of, 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 of the role what I'll add to our conversation is we're talking about bias, we're talking about um, uh, ethical side of, of, of AI, but what about the emotional side mm -hmm. of AI, right? If I think about it again, from, from my sort of uh, career perspective, um, uh, whenever there, there's any career uh, decisions being made, whenever we're talking to, for example, a, a particular type of a candidate, a person that may be speaking with several companies simultaneously, how do they usually make their decision? People usually make their decisions based on emotions. They may justify their decision through logic and mm -hmm. through thoughts and through, you know, sort of logical sequence of events, but the decisions are usually emotional. You so can't necessarily... want to say that if we have artificial intelligence at the final stage, it may be a different choice than if there is a human being sitting in front of the candidate, right? Absolutely. I think we've all seen um, how long ago it was it a year ago, maybe a couple of years ago, the first robot that was having an intelligent conversation with 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 people. Uh, it could have an intelligent conversation with 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 anyone, but it, could we connect with that robot emotionally? We probably wouldn't. Uh, and we saw the facial expressions that were mimicking emotions. It's the same story with AI in recruitment. But that's you a cannot really subject connect we, with. We can also imagine in the future robots applying for a job. I don't know if this is something <laughs> we can visualize that it will be you know artificial intelligence from one side in HR business and the robot who wants to take a job. Of doing something, but that's Sophia. You mentioned Sophia, uh, yes, this yes. female. 
uh, it's more and more advanced and who knows she always uh, already has a face and uh, she's able to smile etc but films like uh, she maybe you've seen you've seen this movie famous movie which shows that the person can fall in love with the uh, um, with the system with the you know system of your iphone so which means that artificial intelligence and the robots can learn how to be emotional they can copy and take you know uh, from us they learn what we do and they can very well i don't know how to even describe it act because they are not real emotions but you perceive them as emotional so in this case let's move to tom i don't know what are the what, what would be the future of the AI, ai um uh, developments in your profession in you know in uh, legal firms that's from one side and also as a lawyer i am very interested in hearing your opinion on the courts you know and uh, giving sentences um do you think it's fair or they are too biased they will be too biased this artificial intelligence judges to let them judge well, first of all, I think it's uh, too early to, to talk about uh, using artificial intelligence in uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, issuing judgments. First of all, but it's happening of, already at the uh, lower stages. It's happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are some examples. Uh, well, in 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 media, but I do not think that uh, they are based on any kind of a general intelligence. I think that a concept of general intel artificial intelligence was uh, was uh, mentioned, and. Uh, well, I, I don't believe, frankly speaking, in creating a, a general intelligence, artificial intelligence, so a system that would really understand um, what uh, it is processing and will have the conscience of itself. So it will be conscious that it exists, because I think that's the feature that would really create uh, an autonomous, really, uh, artificial intelligence. Now we are dealing just with a very specialized systems that are good at one very specific thing but they uh, that is uh, unable to uh, to do uh, to receive uh, to, to get similar results in another area if you take an artificial system for example excellent at beating all human players in go or in chess this system will be unable to for example make a legal research because it was not trained for that and we as human beings are quite universal because i can uh, do various things even in the same time, um, but artificial intelligence is, is very specialized. So I don't believe that there will be in future, uh, well, in the foreseeable future, any systems that would replace judges, that uh, would replace lawyers, um, because artificial systems, they operate just on the data that we um, put into the system, while we, we live in a um, in a open systems, um, and in fact, we live in a world which is created of many con interconnected systems. If we are to, to to make a decision, we take in consideration the facts of a, of a case, but we also take in consideration well data that we have from the past and from other well environments. That's why I think we are able to correct the decisions uh, that. Um, are provided uh, uh, by uh, by various artificial systems. And I, I think Marta mentioned too well uh, the role of emotions and the fact that uh, if we uh, um, if we take a decision, we usually um, have a decision and then we try to to find out uh, logic arguments to justify the decision. So I, I think that's uh, what uh, Kahneman described in his book, uh, Thinking Slow and Fast. So we have, in fact, two intellectual systems. One is uh, fat, based on uh, on experience, and that that's what we call intuition, and we have a, a slow system that uh, analyzes the facts and then uh, allows us to to make a decision. So I, I think we can treat uh, uh, artificial intelligence as um, I think combination of uh, these two systems, but that would not replace uh, I think our judgment and uh, that would be uh, based on data from various sources. Um, well, I, I, I don't like the, to foresee the future. Well, frankly speaking, I, I'm just a lawyer, so I do not like to foresee, but I would like to mention just one very important thing. Um, well, for many years, I, uh, I, um, I tend to 
call myself a technology lawyer because uh, I liked uh, well dealing with technologies, to draft contracts, to advise clients and how to adapt uh, various new technologies. And I always, uh, I never wanted to be a so-called regulatory lo lawyer. Regulatory lawyer is a lawyer that simply uh, advise the clients how to use various legal regulations. The problem is that now technology, I think, must be regulated. And now we have a draft of the first uh, artificial intelligence regulations um, that was uh, published by European Commission. And in fact, it's not the act that would regulate artificial intelligence itself. If you look at the definition of the artificial intelligence in this act, which is very, very broad and even uh, well uh, covers uh, any, any software based on logic. So in fact, any software. Um, so I think it's an attempt simply to regulate technology because I think we all see the technology uh, became so powerful, uh, uncontrolled, that it's really necessary to impose some rules based on which it will be possible to, to um, to assess whether the technology which is provided to us, for example, this recruitment um, uh, system, for example, this chatbot that uh, talks uh, with uh, to candidates, whether this system um, um, is is based on a complete data set, whether it is not biased, uh, whether it uh, will not make um, um, a mistakes of, for example, um uh, rejecting a candidate that would in fact would be a very good choice what uh, mark Pan has mentioned what happened we can take conclusions from these uh, ex experiences like amazon you mentioned and many others uh, i guess but that's also a very challenging thing for the regulators for the lawyers for the, for the politicians who are trying to you know, imagine uh, the development in this business and also try to regulate it. To regulate, you have to have really a very good understanding of the, of the field. Uh, in uh, Otherwise, you can commit many mistakes in regulations and the regulation can hit back to you. And I think everybody noticed how big the gap is between the politicians and, you know, the members of parliament and uh, and regulators, even lawyers and the technology guys when, uh, when we heard the uh, in the Congress uh, where um, the owner of Facebook, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, was uh, trying to explain certain things to the congressmen and congresswomen. And you see the gap. So it's a very challenging time for the regulator, even if everybody agrees that it has to be regulated. We have certain comments and, uh, and, and questions also on the chat. So I want to come back uh, for a moment uh, um, to the to the to the question about how you now really contract these uh, bots or algorithms. And the question is about uh, what is better, Marta, in your opinion, to go for more outsourcing and to work with uh, specific IT firms, IT companies who would offer you more and more sophisticated solutions? Or maybe you, you think just to uh, also avoid maybe biased tools to maybe uh, develop it in-house or to develop it in, in a HR, you know, uh, among HR experts, not only using what the IT technology guys prepared. I'm thinking actually if we're, if we're talking about advanced solutions and advanced technologies, it is probably better in my opinion and speaking from experience here as well to use solutions that are developed externally, ideally tailored towards um, uh, the company that will be using it. Because if we're talking about bias, if the company based on its already existing culture and, and some challenges that derive from that specific culture goes and develops its own system to, if we're talking about recruitment, to attract and select candidates, that bias already existing within the culture will only be copied and, and multiplied through through that system because it's developed by the very people that are within immersed within that culture so they don't have the perspective to see some of that existing uh, bias whilst if a solution is developed externally my my belief is that it actually has less dangers of of having a bias mm -hmm. but i also want to mention that sometimes bias is actually a, a welcome thing um and i'll and i'll say it in uh, in the context of uh, diversity and inclusion and, and another really huge topic that we could probably spend hours talking about here but the way it's linked to to, to bias and technology companies very frequently consider um, 
implementing te technical solutions to avoid bias, to be able to, to attract more diverse talent, to change the landscape of the existing employee workforce. Um, however, what I've seen through my experience, uh, speaking about ethnically diverse candidates in, in the UK market, uh, to, to be pre precise, which is where, where, where I operate, very often we need to be biased um, uh, towards specific types of candidates because they may not come from the same privileged backgrounds like white individuals for example so very mm -hmm. frequently uh, hiring managers or, or individuals within the HR function would make a um, conscious decision to consider a candidate that otherwise on the basis of core skills or core experience would be rejected. And if we had a technology or an AI doing the pre-selection for us, these candidates very often wouldn't even make it through that initial stages of the of the process. So we're talking, of course, to some extent, positive discrimination here, but that's when actually bias is a welcome thing. And this is yet mm -hmm. potentially another danger of using, using AI that could be, um, uh, c c perhaps would, be, would not have any bias, but is it always a good thing not to have bias at all? Perhaps not. Perhaps not. Uh, Tomek, the same question to you, because that's what I think our audience also want to know, what will be the future of you know, your profession being a legal consult consultancy firms for those who offer solutions? Do they expect more contracts from com uh, companies like yours, or you would much rather the lawyers, um, much rather you know, because they are afraid of, these biased solutions go for in-house uh, IT experts to work with? Um, now, uh, there, there are law firms that uh, started to develop the in-house solutions uh, um, that will be used uh, by them, but not because they want to, uh, to, to develop in-house solutions for itself, but because they cannot find a proper solution on the market. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think that developing an in-house solution is um, uh, is quite difficult be because to develop a good artificial intelligence system, you need the access to a lot of data, a lot of different mm -hmm. data. And in case of um, even a large international law firm, it's quite uh, it's a difficult task because you must have a very good sample of of data. The problem is that. Uh, even uh, with the law firms, uh, most of this data is uh, confidential. So it's it's in almost impossible just to put them into one database and treat, this, uh, treat them as just uh, one database because uh, the right to access specific portions of this data would be uh, quite limited. So in most cases, I think it's better to, to go to the external providers. The problem with external providers is that um, well, you must uh, change completely uh, the nature of the contract that is uh, uh, that is uh, um, uh, signed with such a vendor. Well, um, well, artificial intelligence system is a software. So usually companies, the vendors, they propose just a system for a, a contract for licensing a specific IT solution. But um, I don't know whether you have, uh, whether in, in your hand, a contract, an IT contract with a license clause. Usually there is a clause on liability that says the software is provided as it is. So there's in fact no liability. So you take it as it is and use it, but it's your liability, your responsibility for the effects of its application. And this approach might be justified, was justified, uh, in case of a standard software. But in case of artificial intelligence, it is not because mm -hmm. in artificial intelligence system, there might be some errors that results from the wrong choice of data by the provider. So there might be a very important, well, defects. Uh, and and the, the vendor does not want to be responsible for them. So um, I think purchasing artificial intelligence systems from external vendors requires the significant change of a contract structure. I think even the concept of the contract, mm -hmm. contractual liability, um, um, because the concept that we used in the past simply uh, do not, they do not suit the current times. Very interesting perspective. Uh, for those, those who know Poland uh, among our audience would be maybe interesting to know that 
And this exactly this topic is very much pushed now by Professor Blickle, uh, who normally the Poles would associate with uh, uh, Donuts uh, production, one of the oldest companies in Poland producing donuts. But he is a mathematician. He is an IT expert and in, um, he finished mathematics and he fights also for exactly for the, um, the problem, uh, Tomek, you, you were talking about. Okay, um, to um, slightly conclude our, our panel, I want to um, switch to now um, thinking about ethical dilemmas as well. Because we, of course, when we associate, when we talk about artificial intelligence and being biased, we enter into ethical problems, even if we look at the, our government official strategy, you know, just launched in Poland recently, a few months ago, the document which gives us a roadmap in Poland how to implement the uh, AI-based solutions. By the way, we are still not doing really much in this uh, regard. The implementation of AI solutions in Poland in public sector are very, very rare. In business, slightly better, but let's be very frank, Polish IT business will offer such solutions, sells, first of all, abroad. There is not enough demand in Poland yet for these kind of solutions. We are building it up. Um, and we have an in interesting report on that every year done by um, Digital Poland Foundation, uh, State of AI, for those who are interested in more uh, data on the Polish market and vis-a-vis -vis also European market, you will find a lot of information in this report. But even the government uh, visualizes the ethical dilemmas as one of the topic to be addressed. So, Marta, from your experience, um, uh, do you have examples of this kind of uh, problems that you have some ethical problems uh, with using, you know, uh, uh, algorithms or AI solutions because it was causing, you know, some unethical uh, consequences? Uh, perhaps not AI, but may, mainly more um, attempts to use technology or perhaps um, specific uh, uh, pre-selected data. I'll, I'll give you an example of, of situations when trying to avoid, again, bias and perhaps mm -hmm. rejecting people on the basis of maybe specific backgrounds or, or names. Uh, several companies that I worked for made attempts to uh, anonymize CVs removing the name, you know, removing any reference to gender, removing any reference mm -hmm. to age, uh, for example. But you are thinking um, about recruiting, pro, uh, uh, recruiting phase only. I'm talking about generally HR uh, as such, also motivation and, you know, working on the employees you already have. I haven't come across uh, any any such situations, though. I would say that, of course, HR is deeply uh, linked to um, to ethics, uh, you know, by nature, it is supposed to be the frontier of, of, of ethical approach in any company. Uh, but again, I'll come back to here to the to the human to human connection. Uh, you, HR is probably one of those areas that would be the most difficult to implement AI solutions, I think, because of that element of, of, of HR, because of the nature of human resources. It's probably where I see it being more applicable, actually, is other divisions within mm -hmm. within companies. Mm -hmm. Tom, and in your case, uh, for lawyers, that's the comment here that law is, could be also, uh, you know, a result of ethical dilemmas, not well, only artificial intelligence. Well, ethic is a part of law. Well, you, you cannot apply law without applying um, ethics. So um, I, I do, do not see a problem here. Um, well, so I think that uh, we shouldn't, in fact, discuss separately the ethical problems related to use of uh, te technology or artificial intelligence. We simply should concentrate on just uh, um, providing well to people to um, well the, um, the the guarantees of the natural rights. Um, so, for example, uh, in this draft of artificial intelligence regulations that I mentioned there is a distinction between high-risk um, artificial intelligence systems and just standard artificial systems. And for example, recruitment systems would be classified as a high-risk systems. Why? Because that they can influence, so the results of the application may influence the life of people. Um, so that, that's why they are high-risk and uh, they, are, they would be subject of a very detailed scrutiny. So, 
So there might be an audit trade, there might be some compliance procedures and so on. But as that other, other artificial intelligence systems, it's enough simply uh, to inform people that they deal with artificial intelligence systems. I think it's quite important. Now, on a daily basis, we interact with artificial intelligence systems, for example, using search engines. The problem is that quite often we are not aware that it's artificial intelligence. So it may not show all really results that it should show, show because the artificial intelligence just limits the number of uh, results uh, based on some correlations between what we clicked in, in the past. So in this way, it limits also our well, knowledge about, mm -hmm. uh, about the world. Uh, so we should uh, know that we are dealing with artificial intelligence and I think producers or well suppliers of such system should have a duty to inform all users that they provide the solution based on artificial intelligence. So that's, I think it's a real life applications of uh, ethical approach. I think that's a very good point, you know, you made uh, when we think about human rights here, people's rights. So right for uh, right information is our right. And uh, it reminds me my, my own experience that uh, when I call, you know, the, 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 the uh, huge companies and there is a robot speaking to me, I'm not always um, immediately aware of that because in some companies there is this introduction that yes hi i am an artificial intelligence uh, but some uh, recorded messages don't say that and it looks like you talk to a human and you're not really sure if this is a robot or not so maybe you are right thomas that in this case it's better to know from the very beginning because at least you are uh, then aware that there are limits of your conversation with this machine, right? So that's one. And second thing is maybe that it can be also misleading uh, if you don't think that that's a robot, that that's a human being. So ethical will be to inform the customer that that's artificial intelligence you are dealing with. At this stage, in most of the cases you can recognize this, but if we expect the technology to, to, to develop, it will be very easily, you know, a stage that we are, will not be able to recognize at all, right? Um, like we expect uh, in uh, disinformation, unfortunately, we have fake news, that everybody knows about fake news, but we are expecting now a deep fake area when then we will not be able to say if this person exists at all or this interview was made artificially. What if we hear the President of the United States saying that it will be the Third World War? And if it's fake, right? If we are not able to recognize it. So I think what we now have is certain stage of development, but we have to think for the future much more and visualize how artificial intelligence can be uh, developed. And uh, the last question would be about this prediction in your professions, uh, the trends. Because we know that we have two different opinions on artificial intelligence. How can this field be developed? One says, for example, Alexandra Przegalinska in Poland is representing this uh, view. She studies artificial intelligence deeply. That artificial intelligence really will be of use for people. It will be just one more tool, like a hammer, right? More sophisticated, more... Um, with and many more functions, but it will be just a tool. We are absolutely able to program it and control it. But there is also another opinion saying that, you know, uh, uh, we have to go for um, using machines to replace many uh, human functions, even many human professions. Like, by the way, lawyers, some people predict that lawyers will be no more needed, Tom. And um, some people predict the doctors, at least the first stage, this will be also handled by their artificial intelligence. Um, of course, uh, drivers, secretaries, etc. So if we go for this direction, sooner or later, the machines can start control us, not only replace us in certain functions, but also uh, start to be so well uh, learned and taking so many conclusions that they will try to control us as a mankind at a certain stage. I don't know which um, scenario is, uh, is uh, more real. I hope the, the number one scenario, but Marta, uh, uh, in your profession, how do you see, what do you see 
the trends uh, to use uh, artificial intelligence co in concrete situations. You mentioned recruitment, but anything else you visualize the use? More and more. And I see that uh, if I can, for example, compare to the use of data, you know, data, data and HR in the past, two different worlds, absolutely no common points. Uh, for, for, for quite a few years now, data in HR is really prevalent and, and data is used in many decisions, not just in recruitment, but in internal promotions, in salary reviews, in performance ratings, you know, any kind of conversations internally. But it is... I'm giving suggestions we have to finish. So, Tomek, just shortly, in your uh, profession, the trends. Okay, I, I think that definitely uh, artificial intelligence will not replace lawyers. Uh, it will be just uh, one of the tools that we can use. So um, I, I think that due to artificial intelligence systems, uh, we will not uh, be doing various boring administrative tasks and we will concentrate of, uh, on things we love, on uh, just uh, solving problems. Thank you so much for this discussion. So let's hope that the future will be that human being, uh, human uh, humans will use artificial into our benefit, not on the other way around. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you very much, everyone.